Thanks, Michelle. Welcome everybody to our OLLI um, tour of the orchestra presentation today. I'm really excited to introduce our principal double bass of the Terre Haute Symphony Orchestra, Brian McAnally. Uh, he's been with us a few years. Um, uh, he's also been uh, not been performing with us just due to COVID. So I'm very happy that he was able to do this so that you guys can meet him as well. He's got several videos and pictures to share with you about the double bass. So I'm gonna hand it off to Brian. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Sammy. Hey, I'm really excited to be here. Um, so my name is Brian. Um, I'm originally from Ardmore, Pennsylvania, which is about 20 minutes outside of Philadelphia. Um, I did my undergrad undergraduate studies at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston, where I studied with uh, Lawrence Wolf, who's the assistant principal bass of the Boston Symphony. Um, and then I came to Indiana in 2014 to IU um, to do a performance diploma degree at IU, and I was I did that from 2014 to 2016. Um, and then I uh, took a year off, uh, just lived in Bloomington and just worked and gigged. And then I came back to IU for my master's, and I did that from 2017 to 2019. Um, and so I just graduated my master's in May of 2019, and I've just been living in Bloomington, just working and gigging. Um, I also play assistant principal bass in the Columbus, Indiana Philharmonic, and I've also played with a lot of groups around the area, such as uh, Evansville, Owensboro, Muncie, Carmel, um, as well as Indianapolis Symphony and Omaha. Um, yeah, so that's just a little bit about me. Um, so a little bit about this presentation. So I'm kind of structuring it um, as first I'm going to go into a little, a little bit of uh, brief history of the bass um, and then go into the bass itself, the modern double bass, uh, a little bit about how um, sound is created on the bass and really any string instrument, bowed string instrument. Um, and then some aspects about the bass that is completely different and from the other string instruments um, that kind of make it its own, you know, uh, thing. And then I'll go into playing some um, orchestral excerpts, uh, all of which I've played with the Terre Haute Symphony, all three. Um, and then I'll play a short solo and then, uh, yeah, we'll open up for questions. Um, yeah, so just to begin, so uh, the history of the bass is very widely debated. Um, there's a lot of um, histor music historians tend to disagree about um, the exact origins of the bass. Um, they, they do tend to agree that, and, and I as well, it's kind of hard to deny that the bass really is a, um, has many aspects of mainly two um, string instrument families. One being the viola da gamba, and the other being the viola da braccio, which is basically the, the modern uh, violin family. Because um, the, the modern double bass has many aspects of both families. Um, some people argue it's no, it's from the da gamba family. Some historians argue no, it's it's from the violin family. But it, as I'll go along and show you, it has it, you can't deny it has many aspects of both, and it has basically evolved from both families. Um, so the first family I'll talk about is the viola da gamba, which um, means an Italian viola of the legs or leg viola. And I'm going to share a picture of it with you. Um, let's see. Oh, I have to access. Uh, uh, it's not letting me share my screen. It says I have to allow access. Um, so down at the bottom where it says share screen, doesn't let you share your screen? Yeah, it says, it's trying to make me go into my settings to so security and privacy to allow Zoom to share my screen. Oh, darn. I have to oh, okay. okay. So, so a Mac setting. Yeah. Uh, Brief pause. pause. <laughs> yes, I apologize about this. Um, oh boy. Uh, 
worst case, you could email me all your stuff and I will share. Okay. Um. I could try. Okay. Let me try this. Yeah, have you gone into system preferences? Yeah, I'm in system preferences and it's just. And there should be a privacy there. There's something like that in the middle of the screen, actually. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, man. Oh, here we go. I think I figured it out. Okay. Okay, it's making me, I have to quit Zoom and then <laughs> rejoin in order for it to work. So I okay, apologize. Okay. No problem. I'll, I'll make this quick. I no, you I'm shouldn't sure. have to do that, Brian. Go up oh, to the green shield in the upper left. Just put Just next, next to the recording, recording put your, your your cursor. There we okay. go. We can I see your it. screen. Open, Open preferences. preferences. Got it. Okay. I think I figured it out. Okay, great. Sorry. Yep, we can see. Okay, great. Sorry, I did not expect that to happen. I apologize. Okay. No worries. Um, so, with those, so, so yeah, the, the Viola de Gamba, I just want to show a picture of it right here. So this is a, a very beautiful picture of a Viola de Gamba. Uh, just some aspects of the instrument. Um, obviously, viola de gamba meaning, meaning viola of the legs. Um, it is played uh, mostly upright, sort of like a cello, up and down. Um, as you can see, it has six strings uh, made of gut, which is actually uh, sheep gut. Um, it also has frets, and the frets are actually strung around the neck with um, another type of gut string. Um, it's not the, the frets on, on these aren't embedded, as you would see on like a modern guitar or banjo. They're actually just, the frets are just string wrapped around the, the neck itself. Um, you can see it has um, these C-shaped F holes as opposed to the uh, you know, violin or bass that are more of shaped like an F. Um, yeah, and there's also many different sizes of viola de gamba, each one um, having its own kind of range. So just to show some pictures of that, of the different sizes. So obviously the smaller ones um, have a similar range to the violin. And then as they get bigger, they get um, lower in range. Um, and then here's just another photo of the different sizes. And these are all viola de gamba. Um, yeah, and so, and then another very uh, important different aspect of the viola de gamba is the bow and the, and the bow hold. Um, so as you can see here, this picture here, just how different um, how the bow hole is from the viola de gamba than violin. It's held underhand um, with kind of the fingers kind of draped over the stick. And also another aspect of it um, is that the fingers from this angle are actually touching the hair here. Um, because back in the day, um, these bows did not have screws in them, unlike modern um, bows where you can... Modern bows today have a screw at, at near the frog where you can uh, you can adjust the tightness of the bow, uh, but back then they didn't have those. The, the frog here, this this black um, part is called the frog. It actually just clips into the stick, and um, basically they use their fingers to kind of adjust the tightness of the hair, um, you know, as needed or as they you know see fit. You can also see the gut strings here. The very they very much look like rope um, from this angle. Um, and yeah, so as you can see, the viola de gamba is different than the violin in pretty much every way in terms of um, how it's constructed. Um, also, the, I forgot to mention the, tun the tuning is also completely different, tuned in fourths with a third in the middle. Um, and yeah, so I just want to play this, this um, video here, just a um, music um, historian uh, um, player kind of talking a little bit more about the viola de gamba. And I'm not going to play the whole thing, just a small clip. I just really like the way he um, kind of talks about more about it. My name is Jonathan Manson. I'm one of the principal cellos of the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. And I also play the Viola da Gamba. 
known as the base viol in English. The viol family actually grew up alongside the violin family for about 300 years. It was a rich and illustrious history. They weren't ancestors as, as is commonly thought, but um, they coexisted actually very nicely together. And the three main sizes of the viola da gamba are the bass, which is the solo instrument for much of that time, the tenor viol, which is roughly the size of the viola, the treble viol, which more or less uh, is equivalent to the violin in terms of size and pitch. And the three together formed um, the bulk of the viol consort music, much of which was written in England, which is a huge repertoire. They all have a fairly lightweight, resonant construction. They have flat backs and sloping shoulders, which you might recognize from the modern double bass. That's pretty much the only member of the viol family that survived into the modern orchestra. And they all have six strings, apart from this one, which has seven, because it's a copy of a French instrument from the end of the 17th century, when they were interested in extending the range of the instrument downwards to make it more useful as a solo instrument and for continuing. But in general, they have six strings tuned in fourths, with a third in the middle, and then down again in fourths to make two octaves, and then this one has the extra A down on the bass register. They always have frets, and these are uh, old gut strings, which have passed their use-by date, and we tie them on quite tightly. They are slightly adjustable, um, but you don't want them flapping around too much, and the advantage of frets is that they give you a clarity in the sound, because it's the hard edge of the gut, which is actually stopping the string which effectively makes all the notes open strings in a way because it's not your finger which is touching the string at that point. And that combination of frets and the tuning in fourths is also um, could be quite familiar if you know instruments from the lute and guitar families. It's actually much more closely related to other plucked instruments than it is to uh, members of the violin family in that respect. Um, and the fact that it's got this chordal tuning is also um, extremely useful for a lot of the solo repertoire. Um, French composers in particular reveled in the sonorities of the instrument. And another feature of the viol family instruments is that we hold the bow in a completely different way from the violin family. We hold it underhand with the finger, the middle finger directly touching the hair. And that means the strong stroke is the opposite direction. That's the equivalent of our down bow, which you would play like this on a cello. And the fact that you're in direct contact with the hair also means you can feel the string quite literally through your fingers rather than mediated by a piece of wood. So that also gives you a very intimate contact with sound production. And I think all of these features together mean that composers could use the viol in a very different way. Yeah, so that's just a little bit about Villa da Gamba. Um, I just really liked how he lays it all out, very easy to understand. And then I just want to play a very just a minute of, of a performance of a viol concert um, just so you can hear the, the different sizes being played together. Oh, whoops. Okay.
Yeah, so it's very, very beautiful. Uh, I just wanted to share, just to hear, so you can hear what they sound like being played together. Um, so that's the viola de gamba. So there's one instrument in the gamba family that um, I haven't talked about yet, and it's not being played here. Is And this instrument is actually um, what a lot of historians um, agree upon is pretty much the direct descendant of the modern double bass. And that is the violone. Um, just to show you some pictures here. Um, so this is the violone being played uh, back in the day. Uh, you can see it very, looks very similar to the modern double bass. Um, here's another picture. Um, and yeah, the viol violone again was a um, six string instrument originally. Um, same tuning, uh, frets. Um, but it played pretty much the same part um, as the modern double bass did um, in the Baroque era. It um, you know, provided the rhythmic and harmonic function um, of the ensemble. Um, and yeah, and so this is, you know, you can see definitely how similar it is to the, to the modern double bass. So here's just another short video of a uh, music historian just kind of talking about the violone and just playing a little bit of it. So the violone was essentially a transition instrument between the viol de gamba and the modern double bass. Uh, this instrument is a six-string instrument similar to the six-string bass viol. The instrument um, is tuned to D, so like the bass viol, D, G, C, E, A, D, to tune in fourths with the third of the note. The bow is held on the hand, uh, similar to violin. This is essentially uh, an octave lower than the, the bass viol. And the instrument was used primarily in the Baroque to double the cello line um, an octave lower, so at 16 foot as opposed to 8 foot. And the, the strings are also uh, are gut, and it has a fairly uh, raw sound under the ear, but in an ensemble it, um, it gives a very resonant and very rich sound. Uh, and it can just demonstrate the open strings. So the, and the octave. Yeah, just a little about the violone, and then I just want to play just a very short, I'm not going to play the whole thing, just about a minute or 30 seconds, just so you hear what the violone sounds like in a, um, a pop. <laughs> So it's just a little bit how it sounds like. So then I made this um, this slideshow for everyone just so you can lay out the differences of the two families and basically what aspects of each family the modern double um, bass um, has. So again, um, the, the gamba family is played upright between the legs, uh, made with uh, flat back. Um, the Another thing I forgot to mention is the, the corner of the instrument. Um, then I have the little, if you notice on, and I'll show pictures on, modern violins have a little, little uh, kind of like a, a pointed tip at the end of the, the tips of the, of the body of the instrument that these, the gambas do not have. Uh, this, again, the sound holes are C-shaped as opposed to F holes. Again, six strings, two and fours with third in the middle, gut strings, um, frets, and underhand bow hold. And then as you can see, the viola de, de braccio on the side, the violin family, which is you know, again, completely different, played horizontally. That's actually what viola de braccio means, viola of the arm or arm viola. Um, the back of the instrument constructed with a round back. 
They have the pointed corner tips, which again I'll show. Uh, they have F-folds, and these instruments had four strings, two and fifths, um, played with steel strings, um, no frets, and also played with an underhanded or overhanded bow hold. And then as you can see, the modern double bass um, it has the, is played upright like the gamba. Um, modern double basses are made with both flat and round backs, um, depending on the luthier and the maker of the, of the instrument. Uh, basically, the difference between flat and round backs this really affects the sound quality and also how the instrument responds. Um, a lot of people argue that flat backs um, have a more direct and kind of punchy sound, and round back instruments kind of have a more um, projecting sort of sound. So, just important um, structural difference of the instruments. Um, basses also, and again, I'll I'll explain this later and show this. They're they're made with both violin corners and also non um, no not pointed like the viola da gamba. Um, they do have F holes, um, and they're tuned four strings like the viola da braccio, but they're tuned in fourths like the gamba. Um, played with steel strings nowadays, no frets. Um, and as I'll get into again, both the modern double bass is played both underhanded and overhanded both coming from both um, families of instruments. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much um, the history of the instrument. And throughout time, you know, the, the violoni kind of evolved again into the modern double bass. There's been a lot of changes to it throughout the years. Um, there was, um, at one point, um, basses had, had, were made with three strings, um, five strings. There's actually, um, and I'll talk more about that, um, Five-string basses are pretty common now. Um, so they've ranged all the way from three to five strings throughout its history, different tunings. Um, there was a period of time um, sort of around Haydn, Mozart era, where it was, it was, it was in a tuning called Viennese tuning, which was basically um, D major triad. And um, actually two of our major con uh, concertos were written in Viennese tuning in mind. Um, so it's quite a challenge to try to perform them in our modern day fourths tuning, but it is possible. Um, and yeah, and that's pretty much, um, people have experimented and always trying to get the double bass, um, basically to make it more, because it's a very acoustically challenged instrument in general, and I think o over time people are always trying to improve upon it in terms of sound production, um, and basically what they were looking for in ensembles throughout history. Um, one thing about the development of steel strings, um, which I don't know if everyone's seen Phillips talk, basically um, you can see a direct correlation between when steel strings were developed and the repertoire and music that was being written at the time. Um, when you're getting into the Romantic era, you know, um, more sustain, loudness was becoming more important. Um, and at that point, it's very hard to do with gut. So, um, and you can also, with the double bass, you can see direct correlation between when steel strings were developed on the bass and when the level of playing of the double bass and the amount of repertoire and new music kind of skyrocketed because it kind of opened the door, um, being able to make the instrument w way more playable. Um, because with gut strings, they're, again, they're, they're hard to articulate, um, hard to play up high. So the invention of the steel string is really um, skyrocketed the evolution of the bass in terms, again, of the, the level of playing and a repertoire being written for the instrument. Um, so, that, yeah, that's just a little bit uh, brief history of the bass. Um, give me one moment here. Okay. Um, so next I'm just going to talk about the bass itself. Um, so just to kind of lay out uh, different parts of the, of the bass here. Oh, wait, am I sharing my screen? I am not. Sorry, one second. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, I just want to lay out just the different um, parts of the instrument just quickly. So here we have the scroll. This is the head of the instrument. Um, the nut is actually where the strings lie. Um, between Basically, the string vibrates from, from this nut from the bridge. So that area is where um, the strings actually be, the two points of where the string is being vibrated from, not um, into the head where it's being, where it, um, it's being around to be tuned. Um, machine heads. Uh, so we call these two parts here the uh, the bouts, the upper bouts of the instrument. Um, C bout, lower bout, F holes. And here's the corners I was talking about. So see, you can see these corners here are kind of pointed. Um, so we call these violin corners. And again, these um, bases were developed um, 
kind of in, in um, vision of, you know, violin. And so basses nowadays are made with violin corners. Um, they're also made with uh, what we call gamba corners. If I can get to the next. Um, hold on. The, the top menu bar is in my way. Do you know how to make it? Um, here, I'll just do this. Okay, there we go. Um, so here we can see a bass with non, you know, completely different. The, this And this style of um, tips comes from the gamba. So we call these gamba corners and we call these violin corners in the, in the bass community. Uh, there's also another kind of um, uh, body shape that is less common, but common enough that it's worth mentioning. We call these bocetto, bocetto corners. Um, and as you can see, it's kind of almost kind of like a pear shape where the top bouts are kind of gamba corner and then these bottom kind of has these little nice little round arches. Um, again, these are less common nowadays. Most of the time when you see basses, they either have gamba corners um, or um, violin corner tips. Um, and again, that comes from another point I like to mention is, be, you know, because the, the bass is basically a hybrid of the, both the viola da gamba and the violin family, um, it basically means the bass is one of, is the only out of the string instruments the one that is not standardized in terms of basically how basses are built and also how they're played, which I'll get into as well. Um, so as you can see, and what I mean they're not standardized is that um, modern double basses come in very, very vastly different shapes and sizes. Some have huge upper bouts and small lower bouts. Some have, like my bass, have very large lower bouts and small upper bouts, some have very sloped shoulders, um, which makes it can make it easier to get into to higher positions. Um, again, the whole violin, the corners and everything. Um, and just to show you another um, another bass here, this is a De Solo, which is one of the oldest modern double basses that's still around, made in, I think, the uh, 1550. Um, and as you can see, it's a huge instrument. Um, it's actually currently being played by the principal bass of the Australian Chamber Orchestra. but And he's a huge guy, so he's able to play it. But this is one of the oldest modern double basses that is still um, around today and being played. And you can see just how bigger it is, you know, especially compared to this bass here, and just the, the different dimensions. You can see these upper bouts are way broader, not as sloped down. Um, yeah, so that's just one. That's just an, another point I'm, I'm going forward just to remember is that the bass is um, not standardized at all um, because of its basically hybridness of being, you know, having parts of the gamba family and the violin family. Um, just to get my notes here. Um, yes. Yeah, so, and also another thing um, that basses have that is completely different from the other instruments, other string instruments, is that we have um, adjustable bridges. Not all basses have them. They're more um, popular in the United States than in other countries. But because the bass is so big and there's so much wood, which means it's really effective greatly by humidity level. And so, you know, when it's really hot and humid out, the bass, the strings of the bass can get really high off the fingerboard and make it really hard to play. And when it's less humid out and kind of colder, the string height can go really low to the point where even that's unplayable. So what a lot of... Um, bases have are these basically these adjusters here on the bridge and so basically the legs of the bridge are cut in half and then they have these adjusters where you just kind of just twist it um, to get the desired height and so you know if it's really humid out and this, you notice the strings are really high you can just lower the bridge and makes the strings lower um, and vice versa when it's cold out um, such so as one aspect that's completely different um, than the other string none of the other string instruments have um, adjustable bridges um, like this. It comes in handy. I've used it all the time. Um, uh, it's really saved me for a lot of gigs and performances. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, sound production um, on the bass. Um, so I have these uh, these videos here of basically how sound is created and basically on any string instrument. Um, so when we bow a string what we're doing is um, we have the, the hair of the bow um, and we use friction um, with the help of a lot of rosin, especially with the bass, to kind of grab the string. And what we're doing is we're, and we're pulling the string to the side 
and and this is all happening extremely like fast and so we're pulling the string to the side using friction with the bow um, and to a point where it, the tension becomes too great too great and this and the string snaps back and then that just keeps happening like extremely fast and so that causes the the string to vibrate um, and just to show what that looks like in slow motion, I have this really cool video of, this is a violin, but this is pretty much what it looks like in extremely slow motion. Yeah, there's no sound, but you can see the string, it looks, and yeah, going this slow, it just looks like a loose rope. Um, but that's what's happening. Um, so as you can see, the string, it gets pushed to the side and then it snaps back. And it gets pushed to the side and snaps back. And that's basically what's causing the vibration. And again, the vibration is only coming from the bridge right here all the way to the nut, which is just a piece of wood that the strings are laid over. So that's the area which the string vibrates. Um, and then I have another video here of what it looks like on a bass. This is someone on Facebook posted this, which is really cool. Um, So that is what's happening whenever we bow a string instrument. And so at that point, what happens is, um, and I can show you, um, let me stop sharing. So the, the, the vibrations of the string basically get transferred into the bridge here. Hopefully you can see. And then the vibrations of the string into the bridge get transferred into the body of the instrument. And um, the type of wood is very important because it has to be strong enough to hold the tension, the especially with the bass, the extreme amount of tension of the strings being held onto the instrument, but it's still loose enough that it can vibrate freely. Um, and so, the, the, again, the vibrations go into the bridge, then they transfer into the, the body. And this is basically a sound box where all the vibrations kind of live in here. Um, so there's a lot of vibrations going on. And then... Um, again, this is something that Philip talked about. What we have inside the bass, and I have, a, I have it right here to show you, is what we call a sound post. It kind of looks like this. Just a cylinder piece of wood. And this is inside all string instruments. And this kind of goes, it's like pretty much like right here, just in, this, in the body of the instrument. And this allows the, so the vibrations go into the bridge, to the body of the instrument, goes into the sound post, which then travels to the back, which just causes more vibrations. And so... Basically, in a nutshell, that's how sound is created. We create friction with the bow, makes the string vibrate, goes into the bridge. The sound, the sound post makes the vibrations go into the back, and then the whole, basically, this whole body vibrates. So that's just, I just thought I'd talk a little bit about, um, you know, how, and this is the true with all string instruments. Um, yeah, so next I just want to talk about some things um, that are kind of specific to the bass, other than the bridge adjusters. Um, so again, going back to how basses are played, um, basses can be played in so many different ways. Um, um, there's different bows, there's different ways of playing. Um, and again, that just goes back to the, the fact that the, the bass is not standardized, which I actually think is great because the bass is such a big instrument, it, it really makes sense that there's not a one size fit all. You know, with violin, viola, cello, Again, they're all pretty much have the same dimensions, more or less. Maybe the maybe the wood is different, different color wood, different grains of wood. But basically, all violin, viola, cellos, and basses, or violin, viola, and cellos, um, all have the same dimensions. They all look the same, pretty much. Uh, if you get into some modern makers, kind of making some funny different uh, shapes, but more or less, they're all the same. They're all played the same way, all overhand. Um, but with bass, it's a lot different. Um, so one thing that's um, Pretty unique to the bass is um, sitting versus standing, and um, the violin and violas can. I mean, most instruments can play both sitting and standing, but for the bass, it's a much bigger deal because you know whether you're playing the the violin or the viola, whether you're sitting or standing, the the, the instrument is pretty much the same. It's pretty much secure in the same way. Um, you don't have to really change the way you're playing. You know, maybe when you're sitting, you don't have access to your legs, so that's a little bit different. Uh, you know, same with of wood instruments, but with the bass, when we play standing, we have the the um, disadvantage of dealing with gravity, and so trying to play while trying to balance the bass while standing, and especially when you have to go up to the higher positions, the back down, 
especially when you try to, you know, go into really hard repertoire and difficult pieces, um, it just makes it a lot harder. So you'll see uh, what's kind of standard nowadays is most American orchestras, bass sections, pretty much sit just to make it easier. Um, it's just one less thing to deal with. Um, basically sitting, you know, I can complete, I have complete access to the instrument, don't have to deal with gravity. Um, being able to sit for like a two hour concert is also nice. Um, but again, there's some people out there that just prefer standing. There's a few, um, most orchestra based sections sit, but there's a few that stand. I know the principal bass of the Cleveland Orchestra exclusively stands. Um, a few members of the section, various orchestras. Again, that just goes back to the non, not being standard and kind of what your preference is. Um, another thing a lot of people do is they sit in orchestra and then if they play a solo they stand um, or even vice versa. Um, and so it's just a big deal. So, you know, when you see an orchestra, you may notice some are standing, some are sitting. Um, it's just more of a preference thing um, than anything. Um, so that's just one thing that's different um, that's important to talk about. And then um, another thing that, again, going back to the viola da gamba versus violin, is that uh, another huge difference is that the bass has two ways, two different bows. So what we have is, um, we call this the German bow, which is I play. Um, so as you can see, it in, again, this is a direct descendant of the um, gamba bow, uh, just in terms of how it's held underhand. We don't use the same kind of grip. It's a, it's a totally different kind of bow, but it's the same principle of being held underhand <coughs> as opposed to overhand. Um, so we call this the, the German bow, and as you can see, the, the, the main difference is the frog is, is much bigger. And I also have a overhand or French bow, bass bow. Just to see the differences, as you can see, the the German bow up top has a, a much larger frog, and that's basically to facilitate, um, you know, holding the bass or holding the bow um, overhand. And then, hey, as you can see, the the French bow here it just looks pretty much similar to a modern violin cello bow, um, held um, overhand, sort of like this. Um, and yeah, and so that comes from again having two different types of bows. Um, that players can play on. Again, it's not a matter of one's better than the other or one is, you know, uh, preferred. It's just, yeah, so it's, it's basically whatever. Um, a lot of times people will, will pick one bow over the other because it's what their teacher plays. Um, some people just prefer one or the other. Um, they're really not totally different. They both have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, with German bow, one advantage is it's a little bit it's just a little bit more natural just holding it because you know when you're walking your your hand is basically at your side at an angle like this so um, it's a little bit more natural um, when when playing because you just let the weight of your arm onto the string um, you don't have to do anything funny like twisting your arm or anything like that um, so one typical stereotype is that it's a little bit easier to play louder with German bow but you can play equally loud with both, but that's just a stereotype of the German bow. Um, one advantage of the French bow is because it's held overhand, it makes um, string crossings, let me back up a little bit, a little bit more smaller because you can do the string crossing with just your wrist. It's a very small motion when going from one string to the other. With the German bow, it's a little bit more, more of a motion just because you have to move your whole arm as opposed to just your wrist. So. Uh, another stereotype is that the French bow is a little bit more, has more fin finesse. Um, but again, you can do anything with either bow. A master player can do, you know, anything with any bow. It's just a matter of what comes easier on one than the other. I've actually started on the French bow when I first started playing. Um, and then I decided to switch the German to the underhand bow in 2014, right after my senior year. Um, basically, I just started playing around with the German bow, and I just felt that it worked better for me, and I liked it a lot more. And yeah, I made the switch, and so I started at IU playing a completely different bow from my undergrad. So um, it was, uh, you know, a lot to learn, but I'm really glad I did it. It was one of the best decisions I made because I'm definitely way better at the German bow than French. Um, and a another thing with the bows is that. Um, the French and German also, th there are some biases depending on what part of the country you are in. Um, for example, um, in Berlin, 
The Berlin Philharmonic, you can only play German bow. They will not accept anyone playing French. It's only German bow there. That's their tradition. That's what they do. And vice versa, with the French bow, most French orchestras will only play French bow. They will not allow any, any German bow players in their orchestra. Um, and that's just, and, and there are other parts, like Italy is the same. Um, London has a nice mix. And the United States is completely mixed. It's pretty much 50-50. I think there's probably a little bit more French bow players than German bow. But it's generally mixed. Um, there's some American orchestras that have a tradition of one bow or the other. Um, but in general, it's pretty, it's, um, pretty m mixed here. And also in London, it's, it's pretty mixed. Um, and yeah, so it's just, you know, in the United States, it's a matter of preference. But if, you know, they say, if you play French bow, want to play in a German orchestra, you got to learn German bow. Um, that's just how they are over there. Um, but again, there's no, no bow has, a, is, has an advantage over the other, or I should say is better than the other. The sound is the same. It, you know, one isn't, has a, I mean, it sounds are different, you know, based on maybe the bow set different kinds of wood, but in general, it's just a matter of preference. They have advantages and disadvantages. Um, another very interesting thing about the German bow is that there's many ways to hold it, depending on where you go in the country. So I just wanted to show a few um, pictures here. So this is a website from uh, Bob Uphout, who is the principal bass of the National Symphony. And he just laid out, like, like all the different ways that he's found to, to hold, hold the German bow. Um, so you can see there, there's the thumb kind of hanging off the stick with the, the fingers on top. This one here with the, the first finger a little bit more on top of the stick. Um, here the, the, the thumb is more curved with the fingers on top. Um, another variation of that. Um, another variation, this one is a little less common. He's just kind of experimenting. Um, some other variations. Um, and then this is the, where is it? Uh, yeah, this is pretty much, um, yeah, some other variations here. And then he, the way he holds it is right here. So basically, the most standard way to hold the German bow is pretty much, basically there's two main, two different categories of German bow holds. There's holds that favor the thumb on top, and there's holds that favor the first, the fingers on top. So basically the American way of holding the German bow is pretty much like this. Um, pretty much any German bow player you see in America will, holds the bow in some sort of fashion like this with the, the thumb sort of at a 45 degree angle, um, the, the fingers on the side here, pinky on the bottom, and the middle finger kind of just hanging in the hole right here, just kind of hanging out. Um, another variation with the thumb on top is, so as you can see, the thumb is kind of on a 40 degree, 45 degree angle. There's also what some people call the check grip, where basically you make the thumb and the stick very per, uh, perpendicular to each other. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to... So as opposed to this, the thumb is kind of perpendicular, and the advantage of this is that with the American hold, once you get to the tip, and if you can see my wrist, it's kind of like, um, hold on, let me, yeah, it's kind of at a bend, it's kind of bent here, but when you kind of change the angle of the, of the thumb, see it's like perfectly straight, the wrist, especially when getting to the tip. Because another thing about the, the German bow that you have to keep in mind is that you lose a little bit of length in terms of um, the arm. Because when you're out on the tip, you're kind of limited to here, but with French bow, you have way more room, you know, and way more arm to deal with here. So another, some people say that people with short arms should play French, people with, uh, with long arms should play German, but it's just another, you know, stereotype. Um, and then another hold, which was very interesting, that is held by the, um, this is Ludwig Stryker, who is a very, very famous bass player and um, soloist. He was in the principal bass of the, the, the um, Vienna Philharmonic. You can see he has his fingers. His hold is, again, I was just talking about holds that have the thumb on top. He has a variation with the fingers on top of the stick as opposed to the thumb. You can see the fingers are kind of on top of the stick, stick right there on, on top of the, his first finger. Um, so a lot of his students um, play like that over the world, and I can't really play like that, but a lot of his students are amazing. And just to hold, just to show you, this is again what I was talking about, the, the check grip. You can see that it's, it's, the thumb is pretty much perpendicular to the stick. Um, and this is a Polish 
um, bass player Bogoslav Furtok, who is um, principal bass of the Frankfurt Radio Symphony. But again, just to show all the different holds here, this is the difference just between these two. Um, and yeah, you can, depending on where you go in the country, you can find, you know, different holds and things like that. So I just think it's really interesting. I suppose the French, which is basically one way to hold it with the thumb in the, in the crook right there. And that's pretty much it. Sometimes you can play in the stick itself, so a little bit farther back, but um, French bow is just pretty pretty simple in that way. I just think it's interesting with the German bow. It's, it has a, a lot of rich culture in terms of like how, there's so many different ways of, of holding it. Um, so I know we're getting a little bit on time, but I had that technical issue. But just the last thing before I get to play here is I get one thing, and the last thing that's unique to the bass is this, and I get a lot of questions about this. Um, so this is what it's called a um, C extension. Um, and so basically what this allows me to do is play more or less lower notes. So going back to the role of the bass, the role of the bass has always been to, especially in the um, initial periods, to double the, double the cello. And so the issue with that is this note here, that's the cello's lowest note. And our lowest note is an E. Or their lowest note is a C. And our lowest note without an extension is just an E. And so what this extension allows me to do is go down by half steps to reach a full octave um, below the cello C. So, and these are called capos here. And basically they act as just a finger. You can just, they're on a, like a swivel. And you just lift it up and it becomes an open string. And so... This is bass without an extension. The bass is this is the bass. They're uh, the lowest note. And each one I open up, it goes a little bit lower to an E flat, and then a D, and then a D flat, and then a low C. And again, that's going back to um, the bass trying to double the the cello, and also. Um, composers, especially in the Romantic era, were writing just lower and lower notes, and basically to accommodate that and to try to um, figure out how to achieve those notes, um, basically we, they created an extension, basically literally extends the string, that's why we call it a C extension, um, so it can reach those low notes. Um, and yeah, it's nice, um, you can either finger it, you can play it fingered, or, you know, it's, it's really nice if we're holding a low note. Because it becomes the open string, we can just kind of just hold it. We don't have to press down a note, which is nice. Um, yeah, so that's just a little bit about the extension. Um, so I'm going to go into playing now, since we're a little bit running out on time. Um, so, um, yeah, don't so as I said... Turn, turn your screen, screen off. off. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> then we, can, we see. can see. There we okay. go. Cool. Could you not see me at all that whole time? No, we, no could. we could. Oh, okay. Yeah, you were fine. fine. Okay. Now that we're sure. focusing on you. Right, okay. Just want to make sure. Okay, so as I said in the beginning, the three orchestral excerpts I chose to play, um, I've played with the Terre Haute Symphony, uh, all three of them. Um, and so, um, first one I decided to play is the, from probably one of the most important and revolutionary pieces of all time, which is Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Um, and particularly in the fourth movement, um, there's a huge cello and bass feature, which is amazing at the time, that we, that we have this um, written for us. Um, we call it the recits, basically what um, stands for recitative, if you know from opera, basically a recitative is basically dialogue in an opera, but still sung. So it's just basically talking, it's not an aria or a song, it's not in a, in a song form, it's just dialogue in a singing style basically and so this fourth movement opens there's a huge clash there's a lot of n loud um, noise and a lot of um, um, like pointed in the in the in the winds and brass and then basically the cellos and basses have these um, statements there's these really short basically segments that are kind of broken up between statement by the cellos and basses and then a statement by the winds and brass or made it more mostly the winds. And it's kind of broken up like that. And then he goes into, he actually quotes the other, the previous three movements in between these statements. Um, and all of this kind of leads into um, the Ode to Joy theme, which is one of the most you know famous melodies of all time. 
Um, so yeah, I'm gonna play these for you. Um, again, these are just these are short segments, kind of broken up. So there's, there'll be pauses in between each one. Um, and I actually had to play this some of these from my Terre Haute Columbus audition. So another throwback. Um, yeah, so these are the recitatives from the fourth movement of Beethoven 9. Uh, let me just quickly check my tuning. Um, so the next piece I'm going to play, um, and again, that it's a very famous excerpt for bass players. It's asked for pretty much all, or professional professional auditions is asked on all of us. Um, so the next excerpt I chose to play uh, is from Brahms Symphony Number no. Two, um, which we played in Terre Haute, I believe, in 2019. Yes, it was actually just November of 2019. Um, and the reason I chose this is Brahms is a very great composer for bass. He wrote, he wrote his bass parts amazingly. You ask every orchestral bass player about Brahms symphony parts. They're extremely well written. They always have a nice, they're always interesting, and they just fit really well with the instrument. Um, and part of that is because Brahms' father is actually a bass player um, himself, so he had a lot of knowledge and access to the bass and what it could do. Um, and I chose this excerpt from Brahms Symphony Number no. Two, the first movement, just because it has a nice um, um, combination of very articulate and rhythmic playing, as well as some mixed in with a lot of um, lyrical legatic, uh, legato playing. Um, so just yeah, just to me, this is just quintessential orchestral bass playing, um, and yeah, it shows the, the bass really well in terms of rhythmic and well as um, 
legato playing. So this is from um, his second symphony, the first movement, and this is starting from rehearsal E. And again, this excerpt is also asked for in pretty much all orchestral uh, auditions. So there's Brahms, a lot of fun to play. Um, and so, um, next excerpt I chose to play is a little less serious than the other two. Um, so the last orchestral excerpt I chose to play is The Elephant from uh, Carnival of the Animals by Saison. And I play this in Terre Haute, I think that was um, April of 2019, I believe. Um, so the Carnival of the Animals is a piece Basically, it's a 14 movement work, and it's sort of just an exploration of different zoo animals um, and different various instruments gets featured, kind of representing a different animal, and also different parts of the orchestra get features, different parts of um, animals and trying to recreate their sounds and, and things of that nature. And so what's special about this piece for bass players is he's devoted entire the fifth movement to just bass and piano, um, which is the elephant. <laughs> Um, and fortunately, I don't have the pianist with me, so I'll just be playing it without piano. But um, yeah, it's just again, just like Beethoven, it's it's um, maybe not as serious, but it's just you know really great for us to have a whole movement you know dedicated to us. Um, and you know it's supposed to be humorous, and yeah, it's, it's fun to play. So this is the elephant um, from the Carnival of the Animals. <laughs> um, okay, and so I'm just going to play a really short solo, um, 
So what I decided to play is, um, so this is a piece written, written by Domenico Dragonetti, who was a very famous um, bass player um, around the 17th, 18th century. Um, he was a famous, very famous virtuoso at the time. He was actually nicknamed the Paganini of the, of the double bass during his time. Um, and he wrote a ton for the instrument, um, a lot of concertos and solo works. Um, and one piece in particular is actually, from what I understand, is the earliest known work for solo bass written. Um, solo being no accompaniment, just bass by itself. Um, and he wrote a set of 12 waltzes for unaccompanied bass. And um, they're really fun pieces. They really showcase the bass really well, uh, really well written. Um, and so I'm just going to play the third waltz um, from his 12 waltzes. Um, and yeah, and then we'll have questions at the end. So. Thank you so much for, for having me, and um, again, apologies about the technical difficulties in the beginning, but um, yeah, I'd love to answer any questions that you have. Um, great. great. Why don't you Why go ahead and turn the calculation, the calculation back, on. back on? Yes, that is a great idea. And then that way, that way I can ask, ask questions. questions. Um, reminder, if you have any questions, just type them in the chat, and then um, I will read through them along with Brian, and we'll get them answered for you. All right. Well, thank you, first of all, for performing. We don't often get to hear the bass in a solo type atmosphere. You know, I have sat in on a couple bass auditions before, and that's probably the only time I ever hear the bass by itself. So this was an absolute treat. And to learn about all the different bow grips and, you know, I, I definitely learned quite a bit <laughs> today. So thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, let me scroll down here. Okay, uh, first question, how often do the strings have to be replaced both for the instrument and then also for the strings on the bow? 
the hair on the bow. Oh, yeah. Um, so that depends on how often you play. I think a general rule of thumb, um, you know, most professional bass players probably change their strings between, every, between six months to a year. Um, that's a, that's, I try to change them at least once a year at the most. Um, and as far as the bow hair, I usually try to get rehaired. Um, you can usually kind of tell when it's when it's time to get a rehair, um, when the bow just doesn't feel quite right, or if there's a lot of rosin that's gunked up on it, um, or if it's at the opposite, if it's really powdery and there's a lot of dust in the hair. Um, but for rehairs, I also try to do no more than six months at the most. Sometimes four to five every four to five months. But again, for both the strings and the bow hair, it depends on how much you're playing. Um, I've heard a story of a bass player when he was preparing for an audition. He got his bow rehaired at least three times in a month because he was so he was so paranoid. <laughs> um, so, but in general, strings six to a year, six months to a year, bow hair three to six months. At, and at how four. does that compare to the other string instruments? Is do you do it less often just because they're bigger string? Yeah, I I'm not entirely sure. I would say, yeah, maybe maybe less or about the same. Um, I actually haven't talked to a whole lot of other string instruments about you know the the I don't know what they're how, how they change strings and or when they change strings and, and bow hair. Sure. Uh, I would imagine it's probably around the same, but again, it all it always depends on how often you're playing and you know how much. Um, and how much does a set of strings cost for the bass? Hmm. So they can cost up to 200 to 350 at most. That's for just from what I've heard. Um, and it also depends on if you're just getting uh, GDA and a reg if you don't have an extension, just a regular E, the C extension string, because technically it is the string is from here to longer. here. You know, yeah. It's longer, so it costs more. Um, so if you have an extension, you have to make sure that you buy a they call it sometimes on the website extended E um, or C string. Um, so yeah, depending on if you have an extension or not and what kind of strings, they can be on average around 200 to 350. I haven't really heard of any, any sets being more than 400, but that's about the average, I would say. Okay. okay. Um, all right, let's see. Oh, I think we already... Okay, could you talk a little bit about the different types of wood that um, a base might be made out of, or what are the most popular types of wood? Yeah, so um, similar to, uh, I don't know if you saw Chell or um, sorry, uh, Phillips' presentation. <laughs> um, I think for base, it's mostly the same, um, with spruce on the top of the instrument and maple kind of making up the sides and the back. And again, the reason for spruce on top, like I mentioned earlier, is spruce is hard enough to take the extreme pressure of the strings and the bridge, but but also free enough that it can vibrate. Um, so yeah, I would say it's similar to cello with spruce and maple for the sides and back, and spruce on top, and of course ebony for the for the fingerboard. This black wood here, as well, yeah. All right, um, Betsy asks, how did you get interested in playing the bass? Um, and how often do you play guitar versus bass? I think she might have noticed some instruments yeah. behind you. <laughs> um, well, I started on the bass just, um, so I started on the electric bass guitar first. Um, and when I was in eighth grade, because I remember at the time, or no, I was in sixth grade. Um, I, before the bass, I played trombone um, and, um, I was, I was in, in the jazz band in sixth grade and I, I'll never forget when we were handing out music, the first rehearsal we didn't play, we were just handing out music and our music director was just saying like saxophone here, drums, and then he said bass and handed it to the, to the person playing bass. And at the time I didn't know what a bass was. And so, um, I went home and asked my dad about it and he kind of showed me what it was. Because before then, I, whenever I would see rock bands playing, I just thought it was just guitars and drum. I didn't know that there was a bass guitar. And so I got interested in it, and he, my parents um, got me a bass guitar for, for Christmas when I was in sixth grade, and I fell in love with it. Um, I honestly thought about majoring in bass guitar for a while. And then in eighth grade, um, 
I always kind of saw the upright and I, I always really admired it. I thought it looked really cool. And there was one other person in my middle school who actually became one of my best friends in high school, um, was playing bass, upright bass. And I thought it was just a really cool instrument I really wanted to learn. So finally in eighth grade, I asked my band director if I could start learning. And, and he obliged. And look, he was a bass player too. He's an electric bass guitarist and, tr and trumpet player. Uh, but he, you know, he taught the bands and orchestras at my middle school. Um, and so, yeah, I started um, when I was in eighth grade and on the school bases there. And then I started taking lessons the following year and the rest is history. Yeah, I just, just fell in love with it. And um, yeah, it's just my passion. So yeah, I just, that's how I got started on it, on the bass. Great. Yeah. All right. So the burning question everyone wants to know is how much does a bass cost? Or do you primarily lease the instrument? Mm. So basses are generally not nearly, high-end basses are not nearly as expensive as high-end violins and cellos. I think right now, word on the street in the bass community is that the most expensive bass on the market right now is probably around $400,000 to $500,000. Compared to violins, you can buy a Strad or, or um, Granary for like a mil millions and cellos too. So still pretty expensive, but not as expensive. There, I don't know of any bases that are um, charged a million dollars. Um, and because of that, because they're generally somewhat cheaper than the other string instruments, I don't know if many people um, have bases on loans. Like certainly people do that. I know there's some competitions out there that winners um, get to play a bass on loan, similar to you know violins and, and um, cellos and violas. Um, so I, I would say most basses and professional um, orchestras around the hundred thousand mark, maybe two somewhere behind around then. I mean, you can get a really decent, great competitive bass for um, twenty thousand or forty, um, and then once you get up to like the hundred thousands, you start to get into some really like old Italians, um, things of that nature. My bass actually, I bought it for at the time for twelve thousand, but now because um, all the work that I've put into it since then, I bought it uh, eleven years ago in twenty ten. It was brand new at the time. I put a lot of work into it and um, adding the extension on it and some other things just increased the value of it. So I think at this point, it's probably worth um, my bass particular is worth closer to twenty five thousand. So yeah, I gained in value from 12 to 25. Okay. Uh, so it's not uncommon to add the extension onto a base. How much does that yeah. cost just to add the extension? Right, so and it's depending on the luthier, um, I would say extensions are around 2,000 to 3,000. I think that's how much mine were. If you get, if you notice, like I said, these, these closers here, we call them capos. Um, one thing I was going to get into, but we're running out of time, is that there's different kinds of extensions. And if you want to, if you're trying to get an extension on a budget, you can just get the extension without these capos on it. And so it would just be this one here, just to open and close it, and that would be cheaper. Um, but I think with when I bought mine with all the capos on it, it was around two thousand to three thousand, and I got it put on um, twenty fifteen, I think. So. Yeah, generally, and there's some bases you can buy that already have extensions on it, um, but it's pretty common practice if you have a base without an extension. Uh, most bass luthiers, um, mm -hmm. or I would say maybe not most, but there there's well known names that are that are um, have are known for making really good and high end extensions that you can go to. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's it like to travel with the base? Do you have one of those big hard cases that you travel yes. with? <laughs> so flying with a base is very stressful. Mm -hmm. And it's complicated. So what we when we fly with a base, they make these um, huge flight cases that. So we put our base in our. So usually bases are we carry around in um, soft cases. So we put it in a soft case and we put it in a hard, huge coffin-like um, case. It literally looks like a coffin. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and so what we do is we show up to the airport and we just have to check it as luggage and hope that nothing happens to it. There's been many horror stories over the years of bass players getting their, their bases completely destroyed. 
destroyed. I know there was one bass player took an audition in Atlanta for the Atlanta Symphony. He actually won the position, and on his way back, flying back, um, and something happened, and the neck completely snapped off, or something of that nature, on his from flying. Um, I've had I've heard of people having huge holes in the bass from flying. Um, yeah, so it's it's stressful worrying about it. Usually, what it's com it's it's common to kind of tip the TSA agents who carry the bass back to get it checked. Like I usually like slip them a twenty or something just to make sure they take care of it. And also a common practice is not all airports allow this, but you can't ask to because they have to inspect the whole thing when they take it back. They have to open it up and inspect the entire case and instrument. So you can ask to be present for that, just to make sure that they close it properly. Um, not all airports allow that. I know in um, Philadelphia, where I'm from, maybe they've changed since then, but a few when I've flown out of there, they didn't allow me to go back. Um, there was, I remember one time I flew out of Houston, <clears throat> and they just did it right in the TSA line, like the check-in line, like off to the side. And they're really great about it, and they're really helpful. But yeah, it's just depending on the airport and the TSA. It's it's nice that you once you check it, you don't have to deal with it anymore. Like you can walk, around, you freely walk around the airport and the and the plane. But the whole time you're kind of worrying about it. And sometimes you can you can look out the window and see them like handling it, putting on the conveyor belt, going into the base. And sometimes they put it upside down. Oh. Would it make any sense? It would make sense. You put it on the flat part like this you know flat uh -huh. some people will put it on the um the conveyor belt like this with the bridge sticking out you know the, because the the because the case is shaped like a base so where the bridge is it sticks out so i don't know what the logic is there but anyway um yeah so luckily i haven't had any damages the few times that i've flown um but there has been horror stories but yeah it's my long answer to that question but yeah it's it's a huge it's a big thing flying out of the base all right. Uh, do you play jazz? Question. I I used to play a lot more when I was when I was younger. Like when I was in high school, I played in the jazz band there. Um, in my undergrad, I played a little bit of jazz. I took some jazz classes. My dad is actually a jazz pianist. Um, oh, okay. he went to, yeah, he went to Temple University um, for music performance and um, jazz piano. So um, he was a huge influence of mine. Okay. I actually started on the piano, but. Um, yeah, so I haven't played a lot um, since my undergrad. I know my very first year at IU, I took a jazz improvisation class in theory. So I actually was more into jazz before I got into classical playing. Like I knew, and from my dad, I knew all the jazz um, names, like the big names in jazz. And um, um, a lot of influence, especially yeah. from parents. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. So I can play jazz. I used to play a lot more. Um, I don't play as much anymore, but I still love it. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, why do you clean off the strings before you play? What was the towel? Were you getting rosin off the strings? Yeah, yeah so that's a good question. So um, bass rosin is very sticky in order to, as I said, to get enough friction to pull the strings to the side. They're very thick and very heavy. Um, so, so rosin is a big deal for bass players. You ask a bass player like about rosin, they can go on for like hours about it but uh, but um sometimes i just like to um get all the rosin off the strings because sometimes uh if there's too much rosin build up um i can't it's hard to catch the string sometimes i'll get like a, a squeaking or a scratching sound just because there's so much rosin build up so i try to just clean it off before every every piece i play just to make sure it's clean and there's no yeah 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 all right next question um are there because the bass is so big, are there physical limitations that a player might have that might prevent them from playing the bass? Or are there any injuries that you guys have to be very cognizant mm -hmm. of? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, as I said before, luckily, because the bass is not standardized, um, you can find basses in various shapes and sizes. So um, if you're a person of smaller stature, stature there are bases out there that are great instruments that can that can fit, you know, your body if you know if you're smaller. And and on the other end, if you're a huge person, there's also huge full size bases out there um, for people who are bigger. Um, so I would say there's not really too much of a physical limitation. Um, 
maybe you could say if you're shorter, um, it might be harder to reach the higher notes a little bit. But again, if, you know that can be. Um, you can get you can get past it if you find if you find an instrument that fits you and your size. Um, yeah, there's there's things that make bass playing a little bit more challenging if you're smaller. But even at the same time, if you're really big, trying to play a bass that's not your size is also difficult um, because you're trying to if you're uh, if you're really big, have huge hands, and you're playing on a bass that's not that's a little too small for you, that can also be a challenge and limit you. Um, so it's just about finding a bass that fits you. Um, so yeah, it's it's a complete myth that you have to be big to play the bass. I mean, some of the best bass players, um, you know, on the planet are not huge at all. Mm -hmm. um, so, and as far as injuries, um, just the typical injuries with every, any string instrument, like tendonitis, mm -hmm. to watch out for, um, just any kind of overuse in injury, um, and also posture, whether you're sitting or standing, or st I've, I know of some people that have had some really bad back injuries, uh, just not being aware of your body and, you know, moving from the hips as opposed to like crouching and bending your back. Um, yeah, so posture and setup is very important that way because you can definitely injure yourself in that way. But so I would say that, and also just the typical tendonitis overuse injuries in the hands as well. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. We yeah. wind players have the same issues overuse yeah. and tendonitis. And yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Well, that completes our list of questions. Thank you so much, Brian, for joining yeah. us. It was an absolute treat getting to hear you play and also to learn a little bit more about the bass. Um, I thought I would give a quick plug for our next presentations in March. Um, on March 9th, um, we're going to welcome uh, THSO horn player Lane Anspach to talk about the French horn. And then on March 23rd, we welcome Glenn Dimmick, uh, principal tuba, to talk about the tuba. So that I'm sure will be a little bit similar to what Brian did. You're going to get to hear an instrument <clears throat> that you don't get to hear very often as a solo instrument. Um, so definitely join us in March for our presentations. All right. Thank you, everybody. It was good to see you all. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening.